What's up guys, it's Marius from Audio Judgment and today I'm going to show you what to look for in the spec sheet of a particular speaker so you don't get fooled by the marketing and trickery of the audio industry. And I'm not talking about the basic obvious stuff like back in the day when you bought a pair of PC speakers which were 800 watts and your friend bought some floor standing speaker which were only 100 watts and you were so confused because you weren't exactly sure who got suckered. No, no, no. We're going to put the magnifying glass over the spec sheet and I'm going to share with you five things you need to look for when choosing your driver. Number one, frequency response. When you choose a speaker, you obviously look at the frequency response chart. And the flatter the response, the better. Flat response is an indicator that the speaker is a good performer and also it will be easier to blend with the tweeter and therefore a simpler crossover. Now let's take a practical example. Here are two speaker drivers, not so randomly chosen. Which one is better? The answer is obvious. This one with a much flatter response. Okay then, thank you for your answer. Now let me put the price tag for each of these two speakers. This one is $60 and the other one is $360. If I were to ask you again the same question, you probably have second thoughts in making the same choice. So what's going on? First of all, let's address the large spike at the end of the frequency response. This is the cone breaking up and it's pretty common in metal cones, aluminium, magnesium, etc. Which both of these speakers have. This spike looks larger, but if you pay attention to the graph, you would realize that they are pretty much the same size. So we're not discussing that spike, we're discussing this hump over here, not present on the other driver. What's up with that? Well, it's just that this manufacturer is more honest than this one. Or better yet, uh, shows what will happen in real life scenario, rather than what will happen in ideal conditions. You can even zoom in and find out the details. This speaker was measured in a 12 liter sealed box. What does that mean? It means that the speaker box has a small baffle. The baffle boosts the output of the speaker. However, if it's not large enough, only the high frequencies will get boosted. And when we get to the point where the wavelength of the frequency is large compared to the size of the baffle, the baffle starts being ineffective in boosting the output to the point where there is no effect at all. Regarding the other speaker, there is no mention on how the speaker was measured. This usually means that the speaker was measured on an infinite baffle. In reality, the speaker was measured on a very large baffle and the effect is not present and therefore the response looks much better. Coming back to the first speaker, it is even mentioned that the dotted line is the calculated response of how it would look like in an infinite baffle. In conclusion, make sure you find out how the drivers were measured and then decide which one has a better response. Number two, frequency response, again. Now we're not going to discuss the plot itself, but rather the characteristics of the graph. One thing that can make the graph look better is smoothing. If we look at the Dayton audio graph, it is mentioned that the smoothing is 1 over 24. And to me, that's not a red flag. I use the same amount of smoothing for my measurements as well. If we take a look at the response of the ScanSpeak speaker, there is no mention about the smoothing. But judging how jagged the response is, I wouldn't be surprised if no smoothing was used. Though I might be wrong. I tried to find more information about the, the way they conduct their measurements and I found this file. So they measured the drivers on a 6 by 7 meter long baffle. Also they enclosed the speaker in a 320 liter sealed box. This is smart because even if the baffle is very large, some of the very low frequencies from the back will travel to the front and result in some cancellation. Having a large sealed box on the back negates this effect while not adding to the damping of the speaker, since the box is ridiculously large. If you're wondering why so many gimmicks when measuring a speaker, it's because not many manufacturers have access to an anechoic chamber. I mean, they have one, but it's not really a true anechoic chamber. Those are really, really expensive. Anyway, if we come back to the smoothing issue, 
if you add a high amount of smoothing, the frequency response will look much better than it actually is. So if it's not mentioned, be aware of overly curved and flat responses. Beside this, another thing that uh, makes the graph look better than it should is the limits on the axes. The difference between the highest and the lowest value should be close to 50 decibels. In this case, is exactly 50. For the Dayton Audio speaker, it's 60 decibels. In case of this tank band speaker, the difference is 100 decibels, which is misleading. I'm guilty of this myself. My reference was to keep the decibel step to 5 decibels and not really care about the lower and upper limit. You can see in the tank band uh, speaker response the step is 10 decibels, which is not cool. Anyway, take a closer look at this range. If you zoom out too much, the response can look like it's perfectly flat, which in reality it's not. Number 3. Xmax Xmax is sometimes a parameter that seems like a bonus. If it's a high value, great. If it's not, then it's just fine. No, it's not fine. And I'm going to speak from personal experience. First, let's discuss which values should raise a red flag. If it's an average size speaker like 5 to 7 inches, then 3 millimeters is too low. If it's 8 to 12 inches in size, then 6 millimeters is too low. And now some people will raise one of their eyebrows and ask me where did I get those numbers and how they got speakers which match that criteria I mentioned and sound great. Listen, I get that there are 5% of people out there that will mention things like transparent bass and other fancy audio jargon. But for the rest of 95% uh, of us mortals, hear my story. I once made a box using two 10-inch ScanSpeak drivers, a three-way floor-standing speaker. And since these drivers had a high VAS value, the box size requirements were high. The box was like 135 liters and should have been even larger for optimal response. Side note, the X-Max for these drivers is 6 millimeters. I noticed the low value, but logic stated the drivers are large and also there are two of them, so it will compensate for the lack of excursion. After their design was complete, they didn't sound bad, they sounded good. However, the problem was that expectations was very high, because when you make a speaker the size of a fridge, mediocre sounding is not acceptable. My advice is to not overlook this parameter. Also, I want to rephrase the advice. Don't start fishing for drivers with very high XMAX. Just avoid the ones with very low XMAX. Number 4. Physical Aspect You can draw some conclusions just by looking at the speaker photos. The speaker basket, for example. Cast aluminum is great, stamp steel is not so great. Now, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of stamp steel basket speakers out there which are good drivers. However, I did have some bad experiences with stamp steel frame speakers. It took me forever to troubleshoot some weird resonance of a finished speaker box. Finally, after many days of questioning my sanity, I found out that the basket was ringing. I had four speakers and all of them exhibit the same problem. Of course, this is the manufacturer's fault and not the basket production process. However, when I see a cast aluminum frame, I'm a tiny bit happier with my speaker selection. Number five, parameter mismatch. When looking at a spec sheet, try to be skeptical about the parameter values. For example, let's take this sheet over here another tank band driver. This driver has a free air resonance of 850 Hz. Ok, cool. We do know that in the impedance plot, the spike corresponds with this frequency. And the spike is at 670-ish Hz. What now? How do you tackle this situation? Does it mean that the parameters are good? And the impedance plot is from another speaker? Did someone mistype the FS of this speaker? Who knows? You can only take these specs with a large grain of salt, because the manufacturer is either distrustful, had a bad day when typing, or grossly rounded up the numbers. Another thing that is misleading is choosing the sensitivity as the highest value on the chart, and not the mean value. 
not true for this driver. And actually, I couldn't find an example which lies about the sensitivity. So good for you, speaker manufacturers, for insisting in telling the truth in this area. And that concludes the five things that you need to watch for when checking out the spec sheet of a driver. Hopefully, you will now make a more informed decision when selecting your speakers for your future project. Make sure you like the video and subscribe to the channel if you like what I do. And I'll see you next time. Peace.